All right, here we go. I, I am very excited to give this awesome breakout. If you see up here, the title of it, can you, I don't know if, it, it's called Talents and Discernment, What's the Path to Authentic Life? Um, and so, again, this is kind of a crazy talk because I just went through. You guys are freshmen through seniors, some phenomenal so or chaperones out there. Like, everybody is heading in a million different directions. So what is cool is, I mean, I, it, okay, I look, I know, I, I don't know how I look, how old I look to you, but this is a rocking picture of me at 18, so I felt like you needed to know me as a high schooler, right? Do you, isn't that, I just want to talk about my pleather jacket for a moment. Um, it was not a great style choice that, I thought it was a great style choice at the moment, right? But it's just senior pictures. You'll look back at your senior pictures and wonder why also, okay? But I wanted to show you this picture because I stand before you um, as someone who, again, discerning life. If I could go back and talk to this chick, it would be a pretty amazing conversation. What do you think you would say to yourself when you're 33, looking back on the last 15 years of your life? So when I, right? So when I was thinking about you guys, I was like, oh my gosh, discerning in high school. Like, what does that, what does that look like, discernment? And so I wanted to show you, like myself in high school, to know that I'm one with you in a way that I, it wasn't that, that, that long ago. I kind of remember. And then now my life looks a little different. So this is my family. So I'm married. I have 11 years. I know the girls met my family earlier, so swath and the kids. But so I have four kids all under the age of 10. And I, like, if you would have told that 18-year-old girl that this is the party I would dwell with, I just, you have no idea. You have no idea what's in store for you. And so last year on the survey, this was kind of cool. On the 2015 survey, the number two, number three, and number four topics that participants wanted to see at future conferences were, one, how to use your talents and gifts for God. Two, discernment, how to make good decisions. And three, dating. So we decided to put all of these into one talk. And it's only going to take me six hours to get through it all. But um, I wish I had six hours with you guys. That would be amazing. I get 30 minutes. So I just want to, like, put it out there right now. I'm going to cover a lot of material. And I pray that some of it, you know, you're all in different spots in your life. I pray that you take from it what you can and apply it to where you are right now. And you have a piece of paper in front of you. I would, if you want to take notes on the front, that's awesome. But if you could leave the back open for at the end, I have something that I want you guys to do with me, okay? So these are the, this was the survey. This is what you wanted. So I broke this talk down into three questions. How to discern what to do. How to discern what to say. And how to discern if it's love. Sound good? Are you up for it? Does that sound okay? Okay. So how to discern what to do. It's kind of a tough question because, again, the, all of these are tough questions. And so I want to lay, I, I broke this whole talk down into four steps. Step one is kind of like the foundation stone. Draw close, eyes open. What I mean by that is kind of simple. You've been hearing it this whole weekend, probably your whole life from someone in your life. Draw close to the source. Draw close to our Lord. Eyes open. You know what I mean by draw close, right? It is so easy to sideline God. God becomes the ATM genie in a bottle, teddy bear of a God, right? You go to him when you need him, get something from him, and move on with your life. When I say draw close, what I mean is draw close to him in a way that is just, you know, have you guys ever seen the whole, like, when they have coals burning in a fire, if you throw one coal out, it goes cold, right? You want to stay so close to that fire, those coals burning, not only your friends that are burning coals right next to you, but you got to stay close to the source. And then eyes open. What do I mean by that? How many of you feel sometimes like you walk through life a little bit blind, and then something hits you like a train, and you're like, what was that, right? Eyes open. The first step in this whole thing with discernment is figuring out what is messing with you. What's clouding your vision to being able to see clearly what God wants for your life? Is it sin? Is it temptation? Is it people? Is it distractions? Is it boredom? Is it just like being tired of your life and just being down? Is it depression? Is it anxiety? You know your heart. You know what messes with you, right? So eyes open. What is it in your life that's keeping you from drawing close? So that's the first step, right? I really love, do any, anybody know Father Jacques Philippe? Any Father Jacques fans in the house? Okay. Father Jacques Philippe is this phenomenal little French monk. Oh my gosh, like, he's going to rub his cheeks, right? Like he's this amazing man. He's a retreat guru. 
And he writes these amazing spiritual books. And this is one of my favorite quotes from him. How many people hesitate to give their lives entirely to God because they do not have confidence that God is capable of making them completely happy? And they seek to assure their own happiness by themselves, and they make themselves sad and unhappy in the process. One more time. This, like, hit me like a ton of bricks. How many people hesitate to give their lives entirely to God because they do not have confidence that God is capable of making them completely happy? And they seek to assure their, hap their own happiness themselves by themselves, and they make themselves sad and unhappy in the process. How many of you have done it? I've done it a million times. Raise your hand. How many times have you looked at God and been like, it's a great idea, Lord, but, like, I think I'm going to go a different direction. It's like you've been, like, voted off the island, right? You're like, I'm sorry, Lord, we're not choosing you. Like, eh, like you fall through the chair, right, or whatever. I don't know. Like, God puts out these amazing ideas for happiness, and we're all just kind of like, no, I think I can do it better, thanks. Any other type A firstborn control freaks out in the crowd? Welcome. Hi. Therapy session and see after this talk, right? Okay. In my life, remember that picture of the 18-year-old up there? That was me. Like, I really did feel like I just kind of, God was in my life, but he was on the sidelines. And I would just be like, okay, God, watch this. This is going to be great, you know. And then I'd go mess up my life and come back and be like, it didn't go that well. Hashtag shocking, right. Okay. So I wanted to throw that quote out to you guys before we start. Because I think sometimes do we just kind of feel like I, I'm going to just go with this plan. I'm going to go with what feels good. I'm going to go with what I think is going to make me happy. And just hope for the best. But do you think God may have, like, another, another way about this, right? So the first question that we were talking about is how to discern what to do. My desire is his desire. How many of you feel like you're almost paralyzed because you're so afraid to make the wrong decision? How many of you feel like you're just, like, I'm going to mess this up, whether it's my vocation, like, am I gonna, what am I called to do, or, like, what college am I going to go to, or who should I date, or where should I work, or what career should I have? Anybody ever feel paralyzed, right? And you're like, oh, I hope that my desire is God's desire. And then you, like, cross your fingers and throw a penny in the well, right? Like, that is not how God works at all. My desire is his desire. Guess what? Every desire that you have deep down was placed there by God. And the problem is, is that we've, we've filled our lives with so much junk that we have to slowly scrape away everything to be able to see what it is that he made us for. But if you have this, like, crazy desire to do something amazing for God, don't think that God doesn't have something to do with that. Amen? So my desire is his desire. I really love this. As each one has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever preaches, let it be with the words of God. Whoever serves, let it be with the strength that God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through, Christ, through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. What would it look like if we all just had the same talent? How many of you guys are like the social butterfly that invites everyone to youth group? Yes, yeah, sanguines. Woo, woo. Okay, how many of you are the planners, like the worker bees that are behind the scenes, like love the backstage stuff, yeah? How many of you are the quiet cleaner-uppers, the people who like, like quietly clean up afterwards and everyone was like, who did that? You're amazing. I always, when I was a youth minister, I always said, okay, people, set up is fun, clean up is holy, let's go, right? Like, um, what, like, what is your desire? What are, you know, all these different gifts, it's so hard. I stand before you. Remember I told you I'm like a control, I'm like, I'm a perfectionist. I'm a firstborn. I'm a control freak. I get, I have anxiety. I have anxiety. Anybody have anxiety out there? Okay, good. Um, I get, I get really worked up. I get really worried. I get really anxious. And then like God, God says like, hey, guess what, Sarah? I want you to get on stage and talk about, you know, like anxiety in front of, you know, people. It's like, oh, thanks, Lord. That's a fabulous idea, right? Like when, when I, back at like that 18-year-old girl, you guys, my dad, because he's awesome, used to make me read at church, and he would do the first reading, and I would do the second reading because he thought it was good for me. And I would shake so bad at the podium that the whole podium would shake, and little old ladies would come up to me afterwards and be like, you tried so hard, you did so great. It's like, thank you, I almost threw up, I'm never doing it again, right? Like, that 18-year-old girl, right, stands before you, still nervous. Before my first Steubenville, I threw up three times, right? Why? Why do we get so anxious, right? Why? It's so, God has such a sense of humor, right? You know, I sit there and I listened to Jason last night. 
And I'm just like, I think Jason should just give all the keynotes. I think that would just go better, right? Like, right? I mean, why does God, look at this screen. As each one has received a gift, serve one another. Our whole speaker team, we all have different gifts, right? I'm sure Pageant would give a rock star women's session. I'm sure he really would, right? Chris, Chris could kill that, right? But God called me to go over there and give it to you guys. God called Jason to give the talk. Just, you know, it, it just comes together. In your youth group, if all of you were bossy little beavers that wanted to tell everybody what to do, right? Like, would that go well? No. If everybody sat behind the stage and just, like, ordered people around in the quiet, would that go well? No. If nobody wanted to set up and everyone wanted to clean up, like, we wish it was that way. But no. You know what I mean? Like, it takes all of us. The question is, when your desire, when you finally figure out what it is that God wants from you, when that meets you figuring out what it is that he's calling you to do and you seeing that clearly, it's an explosion of grace. And he gives you unbelievable grace to allow you to do things you never thought possible. And that's why I really like this quote. The question is, what does God want you to do? This is a good place to start. Do you guys know the corporal and spiritual works of mercy? It's the year of mercy. Have you seen him a couple times? Yeah. You're like, chick, it's been up in my parish for like two years, right? Okay. So, but what are they? Feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, shelter the homeless, visit the imprisoned, visit the sick, bury the dead. Instruct the ignorant, counsel the doubtful, admonish the sinner, bear wrongs patiently, forgive offenses willingly, comfort the sorrowful, pray for the living and the dead. So it's hard to wrap our minds around, okay, where do I serve, where do I fit? Because it's the 21st century, right? And some of that's a little bit, what, how does that fit my life, you know? Matthew Kelly jokes with me that I clothe the naked because I'm a chastity speaker. Haha, <laughs> okay. Um, so anyway, what's the point? Like, what I want you to look on this list and say, like, what makes me come alive? What makes you come alive? Maybe it fits into a category here. This is just a good way to get, you know, your mind started on, like, what makes me come alive? The problem is, like the ladies and I were talking about earlier, we typically don't ask ourselves, like, Lord, who do you want me to be? We typically ask ourselves, like, who does my boyfriend want me to be? Or who does my girlfriend want me to be? Or who do my parents want me to be? My parents really want me to serve in this way. That's great. Do it. But then after a little while, if you're like, gosh, I really feel called to this other way of serving. Like, the point is, is that you're serving. How beautiful is that? So this is just like a little slide I wanted to show you because I think it's important to just throw it out there. But this is, this is I really love this quote from St. Ignatius. It is not so much a process of discernment. Be a person of discernment. Isn't that good? So do you guys ever feel like, okay, I'm the queen of this. Once I figure this out and I, I get this straight and I get all my ducks in a row, then I'll be happy. Like once I figure out where I'm going to college and I sign that paper and I get that full ride, then I'll be happy, right? Once I figure out which of these two guys I'm going to date, then I will be happy, right? I'm sorry, guys. Guys, right? Fellas in the house. Once I decide which of these three girls I want to date, then I'll be happy, right? Because they all want me. And I know it's just so hard, right? Okay. Got to make sure the fellas, you're with me, fellas, right? Yeah, yeah. Be a person of discernment. That was kind of a joke, but you guys are with me, right? Yeah? What is the difference? A process of discernment looks like this. I'm trying to figure out this little, like, secret code, and maybe God will throw me a bone. Is that how it works? No. Sometimes the, when I say discernment, a lot of you, are you guys thinking, like, marriage, priesthood, sisterhood? You know, like, sometimes it's like big V vocation, right? The big V vocation. What am I called to do? Am I called to serve God as a married person? Am I called, to, called as a priest? Am I called as a religious sister, as a consecrated? Like, those big V vocations. How many of you are terrified of screwing that up? That's fair, right? It's a big decision, right? How many of you are terrified of some of those little V vocations, Right? Like, what am I going to do for a career? What am I going to do even for, like, my volunteer? Like, what do I want to do with my life? How do I want to serve others and serve the Lord? Like, those are all scary things. But if it's not a process, if it's not like a once I solve this, then I'll be fine kind of thing, but you're a person of discernment, it's different. With your big V vocation, um, there's this really sweet Dominican, he's an amazing priest. He's actually my Fulton's godfather. And we were sitting around in the kitchen one night, and he was... He went to Franciscan, and he was trying to discern whether to go to the, the priesthood or to continue dating a girl. And we were sitting in the kitchen, and it was really great because he, he was pouring out his heart. 
And this, I mean, it was just a beautiful watching someone discern through what to do. And then two years later, after he had decided to go to the seminary, he was like in the in full blown, you know, trying to figure everything out, but also just an amazing seminarian. He said this in my kitchen. So I told him I'm writing it down. Your vocation is not a problem to be solved, but a gift to be received. I was like, dude, you're a prophet. I'm writing this down on a napkin, right? Like, your vocation is not a problem to be solved, but a gift to be received. Do you believe that? Or do you see it more as like a puzzle that you have to figure out in order to not mess up? That's how I saw my vocation. It was like, don't screw it up, don't screw it up, don't screw it up. Do you think that's how our Lord wants you to approach this? No way. Be a person of discernment. It's a gift to be received, right? I want you to have, like everybody take a deep breath in and let it out. We're taking a vocational breath right now, right? Okay, big V, little V, all of it. It's a gift to be received. And I just, I want you to hear that because I think a lot of times, do you ever feel a lot of pressure put on you? How many of you feel pressure from the world or from your teachers or from your friends or from whoever it is? I'm from Atchison, Kansas, you know, so Kansas, yep, Dorothy Toto in the gang. Do you guys know that freaky part in The Wizard of Oz where the guy's like back there cranking the curtain? You know that like green, anyway, you know the, the, the wizard and he's back there like, I feel like sometimes that's the world's idea of perfect or the world's idea of what you should be doing. All that pressure. It's like this scary kind of creepy man behind a green curtain like going like this and like stressing everybody out. Do you guys feel that? There's four steps to discernment. Pray, seek counsel, have patience, and then jump. Pray, seek counsel, have patience, and then jump. Pray is obvious. Draw close to him. Eyes open. Draw close to what it is, the source. But also have your eyes open to what's messing with you. The ladies and I talked about this a lot this morning. Being the boss of your thoughts. What clouds your vision? What distracts you from hearing the voice of God? Even just knowing how God talks to you, how do you like to pray? Are you... a uh, 20 minutes before mass goer to get your quiet time in? Are you a morning person where you like to sneak into the chapel? Do you like to do your time in the morning at home where you have your journal and you have your Bible and you have your, your Magnificat? Like, I mean, it, it's just like, what is your prayer regimen? Do you love going to adoration? Do you love like, being with friends and talking about so that your spiritual life? Do you guys see how this, it's going to look different for everyone, but prayer is so important. You have to stay connected to him. And then seeking counsel. How many of you have someone in your life that, like, is a great listener? Think in your head right now, the person in your mind that's, like, the best listener. Okay, now try to think of the next person. Who's, who's your second best listener? Do you have a person in your mind? Do you have a third best listener? Isn't it kind of hard to get past two? What does that tell us about ourselves? Did you guys have a hard time getting past two? Or is that, do you guys know what I mean? That are like really good listeners? Who do you go to to seek counsel? Are they the right person to be going to to be seeking counsel? Who are your best listeners that you know have your best intentions at heart? And then have patience. Big V or little V, you guys, it's going to take some patience. Amen. You have to have patience with yourself. You have to have patience with God, his timing, his plan especially with dating, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But you have to have patience. And then did you see, like, like there's space there, and then jump. How many of you feel like you've overthought, overworried, overprayed something to death, and everyone around you is like, jump, right? And you're like, like white-knuckled holding on to something. Do you guys, have you ever done that before, right? It's like, jump. Sometimes you just have to go out on faith and jump, Right? So pray, seek counsel, have patience, and then when the time is right, jump and don't guess. If you've prayed about it, you've sought counsel, you've had patience, you've let time dictate where you're at, sometimes you just have to walk out there and say, okay, God, let's do this. I'm jumping. And then you can learn from what comes from it. I mean, it, it might not be the perfect everything you thought it was going to be. You may, as some like to do, you know, the seven years of college and the victory laps. That's fine, right? Like, who, all the parents are like, don't say that. That's not fine. That costs a lot, right? But, like, do you know what I mean? Like, it might take you a while to figure out after you've jumped exactly what you're jumping into. That doesn't mean the path was wrong. 
So those are the four, or those like are the four little steps that I think are really important. And then the third, step three, my words are his words. How to discern what to say. I put this little category into how to make good decisions. Do you guys ever struggle with like questioning whether or not you're making a good decision? In my house with my children, we talk about what is a poor life choice and what is a good life choice, right? Like Jason was saying last night, eating diaper rash cream is a poor life choice, right? You've made a poor life choice, son. I'm sorry, right? Sometimes do you feel, um, I, put, I put in this, my words are his words, because in my ministry, I have a lot of people, we talk a lot about social media and texting. How many of you feel sometimes like you, is it hard to have your own personal identity and to have your social media, your digital identity? Do you feel sometimes like you have two? Or do you feel sometimes like it's a lot of effort to keep up the digital one? Nod your head, yes. Do you ever feel like that's kind of exhausting? I mean, when I was putting this talk together, this was, the, this was what kept coming back to me, Luke 6, 24. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Isn't that beautiful? But it's also like, it's kind of intense. How many of you have ever looked through someone's feed and in about three minutes, you can pretty much figure out what they're about. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Ooh, that got like a giggle. Do we need to stick with this for a minute? Um, it's kind of a scary world out there, isn't it? I mean, everyone always tells me, especially when we get to the dating part, uh, it's funny because girls and I, we talked about social media stalking and mental stalking this morning. But I also talk to the guys and I'm always like, so do you guys like social media stalk or do you guys do that? And they're like, no, no. I'm like, so how do you like know, I mean like, do you? And they're like, no, no. And I said, well then how do you like approach a woman in the 21st century? And they're like, oh, well you like, you meet someone and then you jump on and look at their pictures to see what they're about. And then you like try to get their number. I'm like, that's social media stalking. And they're like, oh yeah, we do that, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so here's, the, here's the problem, right? Herein lies the problem. How many of you are like, gosh, I wish the opposite sex would just get to know me for who I am. And then you feel all this pressure to like be perfect on social media. And to have this like persona and this image and this identity that's just spectacular and always on point. Right? What happens when this, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. What happens when that comes face to face with your identity? Like what you say out of your mouth, like physically your words out of your mouth, says a lot about what your heart is full of. And you guys, like I said, like told the women this morning, like I got married before I, I, social media came out like the year after I got married. And I didn't text until after I was married. But here's the deal, you guys, like, like it or not, your social media and your texting is, is what your heart is full of right now. I mean, that, like, that's. Like, before, it was just words, like all the old people in here, you and me. Like, that was just the what we spoke is how you knew me. But social media adds a whole other dimension where I can judge you and I can see you and I can pick you apart based on your social media. How many of you have ever been misinterpreted in a text? How many of you have ever been hurt by a text? How many of you ever wished that Apple would create a delete button? What the heck, Apple? You're Apple. Cancel. Cancel, 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 cancel. Come back. Right? Your Apple, find the cancel button, right? I'm worried, the reason why I'm spending time on this, like, what to say, is because it's actually, I mean, this is kind of what the quote I want, my husband says this all the time, don't ask, what should I do in this situation? Ask, who do I want to be? Don't ask, should I post this? Ask, what kind of person do I want to be? And would that person post this? Do you see the difference? To look at a situation and say, what do I want to do in this situation? What's good for this particular situation? It's like that's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is I want to be a certain person. I want to form this person to make the right decision in all places, in all times. That includes from my actual words to one-on-one -on -one to a person. And that includes in my social media and in my texting. You guys get a lot of... Uh, you guys get 
like, people, parents come to me a lot and say, like, gosh, like, my teens are on their phone all the time. Like, they don't pay attention to our family. They don't care about us anymore. They're more interested on their, on their phone, like, at the dinner table. I can't get their attention. And I'm like, I understand that, you know. But then, like, one night after one of my talks, I had a girl come up to me. And she was, we were talking, and she was telling me about her life. And all of a sudden, she just started, she just broke down in tears. And I was just, like, hugging her. And, you know, I just said, I was just kind of letting her talk. And she looked me in the eye with this unbelievable pain. And she looked at me and she said, you're the first person that's looked me in the eye for more than five minutes for like two years. And I was, I was just taken aback. And she just said, she's like, my parents are always on their phone. They just don't have time for me. And that's a change. I've been in my ministry for like 10 years. And in the beginning, it was of the teens were on their phone. But now, it's also the parents are on their phone. How many of you would rather text than have an actual conversation? Right? How many of you, I mean, when I'm, I hang out with college students a lot, you know, and they tell me all the time, they're like, I would never say that to them in person, but I'll text it. And I'm like, is it positive or negative? And it's like both. Like, I would never compliment them to their face. That, face, that would be awkward. I would never trash her, like, to her face. I would just do it in a text. It's like, awesome. Okay, good. Okay, where do we go from here, right? Like, what I'm talking about here is what do I say in this situation, not just what should I do in this situation. Should I send this text or not? Should I post this? Should I rant about this? Those are all questions. Those decisions come from being a person of character, not making a choice of character. Amen? The girls and I talked this morning about the simply irresistible virtuous woman and the simply irresistible virtuous man. Ladies, would you like me to show the men the, the, their slide? Okay. I figured that would be a, a hit, right? Okay. Every time I give my, my, my girls talk, the girls, first, you know, all the questions are like, uh, when are you giving this talk to the guys, right? And all the guys are like, what, how did I get roped into this? Excuse me, what, right? I brought these slides out just because I think it's important for you guys. When I said, who do you want to be? Did any of you have, like, that blank, like, cloud, the bubble cloud that's just, like, a big blank? Yeah? I respect that. Remember the 18-year-old pleather girl? Yeah, that was me, too. Okay, good. So who does God want me to be? When I said I want you to make good decisions, his words are your words, when I said that to you, and I said it's not just what should I do in this situation, but who do I want to be, and that big question mark came up, like I told the girls, a lot of times we know everything we're not supposed to do. No, 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 no. But what are we saying yes to? That's a hard one. So, fellas, um, we, it's over the past few years we've been ask, asking the opposite sex, like, what's the most attractive thing about a woman or what's the most attractive thing about a man? So this is the woman's slide. The simply irresistible virtuous woman. She's feminine, she's confident, and she's committed. She's feminine. She's gentle and kind, graceful and sincere, patient and flexible, doesn't gossip, isn't rude, tries to eliminate drama, not create it, poised and modest, open to the needs of others, nurturing and welcoming, joyful and fun. She's confident. She stands up for what is right and seeks the truth. She has courage and she's not afraid to confront and help someone. She's genuinely excited for another, not jealous or vain. She speaks with conviction. She's a responsible, prudent, humble and honest. She's secure. She's sensitive to the needs of others. She's committed. Her relationship with God comes first in her life. She puts others first before herself. She strives for excellence in all things, in chastity and sobriety, and tries her hardest in academics or her career. She's not led solely by her emotions and passions. She maintains balance and order in life. She lives a life of charity and service. She's forgiving, trustworthy, loyal, and pure. All the ladies in the house, take a deep breath in and let it out. And repeat after me, striving. 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 It's beautiful. You guys sound good. Okay. Not perfect. Not perfect. Because perfect, because perfect. Doesn't, exist. doesn't exist. Striving. Striving. Deep breath in and let it out. Okay. Since the fellas weren't with us earlier, I want to ask them, fellas, is this woman attractive? Oh, claps. Okay, that was good. That was pretty good, ladies. Did you hear that? That was good. Um, is this woman a woman of character? Okay, this is my favorite one, okay? Would you like to marry a woman if you're called to marriage? Would you hope that your wife takes on these, striving for these, these attributes, these virtues? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> ladies, I think that's the most enthusiastic we're going to get. That was pretty good, right? That was pretty good. Okay. Fellas. Do you want to see the simply irresistible virtuous woman? 
Put up the slide. Put it up, lady, right? Okay. Or the man, sorry. Here's the ladies. You want to see the man? Here he is. He's masculine. He's confident and committed. Guys, I promise it's not going to be too painful. Masculine. He's a leader, provider, protector. He's an initiator. He's chivalrous, brave and courageous, gentle and respectful, intuitive and patient, joyful and fun. He's confident. He stands up for what is right and seeks the truth. He has courage and is not afraid to confront and help someone. He's genuinely excited for another, not jealous or vain. He speaks with conviction. He's responsible, prudent, humble, and honest, secure, sensitive to the needs of others. He's committed. His relationship with God comes first in his life. He puts others first before himself. He strives for excellence in all things and chastity and sobriety and tries his hardest in academics or his career. He's not led solely by his emotions and passions. He maintains balance and order in his life. He lives a life of charity and service. He's forgiving, trustworthy, loyal, and pure. Okay, fellas, I don't need to do, like, deep breathing treatments with you. I know you're okay, right? But, like, men, repeat after me. Striving. 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 Okay, now women, fan yourself. It's just a natural reaction. Okay, good. Awesome. Okay, good. Spontaneous. It's okay. Um, Okay, so, guys, ladies, it's important for you to remember, there's not a man walking the earth that is perfectly all these things at all times. Amen? So to expect your husband or your boyfriend or your brother or your dad to be perfectly these things at all times is probably not going to happen. But like we talked about this morning, what is ridiculously attractive about these virtues is the act of It's not because, oh my gosh, you checked off these amazing boxes and we're so proud of you and where's my ring? It's, this is like, this is what I'm looking for because we're all in this together. Did you guys notice that confident and committed are the exact same list? Ladies, did you see that? Did you get that this time? Fellas, did you see that? Do we share humanity? Yes. Are we a little different? Yes. Here's the thing. You're a person of character. You hold in your hand the power to build up or completely destroy the opposite sex. Put your hand out. You hold in your hand the power to build up or completely destroy the opposite sex. You have that power, you have that choice, and you know you have that power. You can choose this list, and you can help build up the opposite sex because we're in this together, or you can completely destroy them. Guess where a lot of this game starts? It starts with your mouth. You say what your heart is full of. You text what your heart is full of. You put on social media what your heart is full of. Amen? Making good decisions isn't a one-time thing. Wow, I made a good decision there. Like, phenomenal. I'm good for like two months. Yeah. Right? Like, no. Like, you're a person of character. You're a person of discernment. That's what it's about. All right. So, next. We're going to go through this really fast, okay? Um, I'm going to skip this part because I want to get to what is my love is his love. Do I have five more minutes? Is that okay? Five? Okay, good. Um, How many of you are glad that I'm talking about dating because that's like a big discernment question? Okay, good. How many of you know that this is like a three-hour talk? Okay, good. So I have five minutes, but we're going to do this, okay? How to discern if it's love. Did you see see that? My love is his love. That's a big question, right? I call it the natural progression of a relationship. In my ministry, in my line of work, uh, typically in the world, the world has three steps. I call it the gray area, talking, texting, hanging out. We talk, text, hang out, hook up, move in together, marry each other or not, who knows. That's the world's view of dating. Many people have told me that dating doesn't exist anymore. Well, I was, on an, I was at an East Coast school, and I, everywhere I go, I'm like, how's dating here? Like, what's the dating scene like? Tell me about it. And I was at a, a university on the East Coast, and the group of leaders with me were all sitting around, and it was quiet. And then all of a sudden, a girl, she goes, well, I mean, I guess dating is where, I mean, a guy, like, well, like, they'll hook up, and then, like, when the guy deems the girl worthy to, like, be seen in public with her and like take her out and spend money on her like I guess they're dating then I think we would call it that I was like oh my gosh I just threw up in my mouth like (laughs) seriously is that dating right now on college campuses you guys it's kind of what it looks like is that how you want to date is that like your is that I mean I decided to like throw in a couple more steps for kicks and giggles you guys up for that okay good so the natural progression of a relationship here it is acquaintances True friends, defining the relationship, having a DTR, dating, courting, engagement, and marriage. Do you see how I added a few just for kicks? Okay, good. Quickly, acquaintances. Hey, how's it going? I've known you my my whole life or I just met you. 
acquaintances, right? True friends. Probably one of the most important steps on the whole thing. Ladies, we talked earlier, find your posse, your tribe, your squad, right? The ladies in your life. Fellas have to find their posse, their tribe, their squad. I don't know what they call it, their crew. Whatever you want to call it, right? You find that and your true friends. What does that mean? It's not a flirt fest. It's not who am I going to date from the other squad. It's I want to learn to love you like a brother in Christ or I want to learn to love you like a sister in Christ before I try to date any of you. But guess what? Your true friend group is a good place to start with this whole, this whole dating game, right? But what gets messy? Gray area. Talking, texting, and hanging out. Do you know the gray area? You know what I'm talking about? Okay. So true friends. Then you move to defining the relationship, having a DTR. Fellas in the crowd, repeat after me. Sincerity and clarity. Sincerity and clarity. You want to win a woman's heart, you be sincere and you be clear. Amen, ladies? Ladies, repeat after me. Sincerity and clarity. Sincerity and clarity. You are not a drama-filled creature. You can eliminate your drama by being sincere and clear. Amen? Look at the men around you and say, I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying. Say, it's my new goal. It's my hashtag goal right now is to eliminate or minimize drama in my life. Right? Okay, back here. I got five minutes, people. Two. Okay, see the defining the relationships? You have two stating your intentions. There's two. The first stating your intention is you got your posses, right, your two groups. All of a sudden you start noticing that, like, oh, my gosh, I keep, like, naturally gravitating towards this person of the opposite sex, right, At, from your friend groups, from your true friends. So you have your DTR. There's two of them. The first one is, hey, I'd really like to get to know you better without the other 20 people in our posse around. That's the first DTR, right? I'd like, I'd like to get to know you better. There's a second DTR. After you've gotten to know each other, it doesn't have to be like six months or six years, but it says, I think we might be called to date. I'd really like to see what dating looks like in our lives. Okay, second DTR, right? Then you move to dating. Do you guys see um, dating and courting? They're both on here. See dating and courting? Okay, everyone's like courting. Jane Austen, yeah, get it, girl, right? No one knows what courting is. And then everyone says, okay, isn't dating and courting the same thing? I think for 21st century purposes, we have to make a distinction, right? Dating. Tell me if you think there's a difference here. Dating. I'd really like to get to know you better and see, like, if we're called, you know, to something more here. Like, let's go to coffee. Let's go to dinner. I'd really like to see where this is going versus courting, which is, I think I'm called to marry you. Slight difference. I don't know. Are you feeling it? A little, like, a little bit of a difference, right? Like, okay, yeah, I think you're kind of, okay, so your true friends, so you already, because you're friends, you've already like eliminated quite a few people with true friends. Checks and balances, people. When you're, ladies, when you're with a group of men and they're with their guy friends, you get to know the real them. Anybody can put on a show from 7 p.m. to midnight, be whoever they want to be, like knight in sh you know, shining armor, woman of wonderful. Like they can be whoever they want to be. And then at 12.01, they turn back into who they were at 6.59, right? Like they can do that. But with your true friends, if you're going out with his friends and you're going out with your girlfriends and you're all together, is it? Is it, if you start not acting like yourself, someone's going to call you out. And if you start a flirt fest that's not on a text, someone's going to call you out. Right? What does texting do? It makes everything quiet. Right? It makes everything secret. Everybody has, from my experience, guys and girls both have a standby list. I have five or six people on standby that I talk, text, and hang out with until someone falls off the list and I put a new person on there. Nod your head up and down. I'm not telling you nothing you don't know. Right? So we have standby list. Does that confuse sincerity and clarity? Yes. Is it sincere and clear to flirt with six or seven people on text until someone emerges, emerges as a person you want to, like, hook up with? Shh. Right? Like, come on. Did you guys see dating and courting and then engagement and marriage? Engagement. Do engagements get called off? Should more engagements get called off? What's harder in the 21st century, to call off a wedding or to get divorced? To call off a wedding and you know it's true. Let's all just have a moment right now. Let's just sit with that for a minute. It's harder in our day and age to call off a wedding than it is to get divorced. Do you guys hear, do you feel it? Do you think this list is important? If that is what it's come to, do you think, okay, you just told me, capital V vocation, if you're called, figuring out if you're called to marriage or if you're called to be a religious or if you're called to be a priest is the most important decision in your life. So if you're called to marriage, do you think maybe we should play this discernment game differently than the way we play it? Do you think we have to figure out how to eliminate or minimize the gray area? Do we have to be sincere and clear with our words in person, with our words on social media, and our words in text? Like this is huge for the dating game. 
It's huge for clearing the junk out of your life so that you can draw near and draw close to God. So much of this comes back to our relationships. How do you know when you're ready to move through these? How do you know when you're ready to move? You've asked yourself. Oh, yeah, that's a good slide. Don't just love people for how they make you feel or for what they can do for you. I feel like that's a good slide. Okay, we're moving on. This is how you do it. God, virtue, time, trust, and honesty. I'm going to end with this. When you're questioning, should I move to another step in the natural progression with someone, when you're questioning what to do with your life and you look at this list, how does God fit in? How does virtue fit in? How does time and trust and honesty? Can I be completely honest with this person? Do I trust this person to be virtuous with my heart, with my soul? Do I trust them? Have I given it proper time? God, timing, and chemistry. It's so important. Right? These are huge questions, and I don't mean to, like, dump this on you, but I feel like in the, this whole dating thing is so important. So, step one, draw close, eyes open. Step two, my desire is his desire. He wrote your desires on your heart. He knows them better than you, and he wants them just as much as you do. Let God have a role to play. My words are his words. What you say reveals what the heart is full of. What is your heart full of? And then my love is his love. How do I discern if it's love? It looks like him. Right? Surrender and strive. I want you to surrender your life to him, and I want you to strive to be the person transformed by his love. That's all we can do is trust him and give our lives to him. You can be confident that he's going to make you happy beyond your wildest dreams. You don't have to fear discerning a person of discernment with him.